Historians studying the Netherlands' history sometimes refer to the 17th century as the Dutch Golden Age. The term refers to an era of unprecedented wealth in the Dutch Republic, when artists such as Rembrandt van Rijn and Johannes Vermeer painted masterpieces and intellectual life flourished in cities like Amsterdam and Delft. But this glittery phrase obscures a dark truth. Many of the Republic's wealthiest residents made their fortunes through the enslavement, sale, and exploitation of African people. However, unlike the Portuguese, the Spanish, Britain, the French, and the USA, whose involvement in the barbaric act of the slave trade is well known, the Dutch hope to bury this truth and continue to deny. Just like the Argentines wiping out their black population and keeping the records off history, the Dutch want the world to forget they ever played a part. In fact, Dutch hagiographers busy themselves by blaming the victims of slavery, claiming that African chiefs sold their people to God-fearing traders from Europe in a bid to make slavery seem like a fair deal. While the small country has done a great deal of hiding its dark past, this video is going to reveal all the dirty secrets and brutality of Dutch slavery that once wiped out African civilizations, tore families apart, and treated human life like cargo to be bought and sold. We are going to reveal the steps Dutch has taken to make restitutions for its dark past. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. From the early 17th to the mid-19th century, slavery played a fundamental role in the Dutch colonial empire. All overseas possessions of the Dutch depended in varying degrees on the labor of slaves who were imported from diverse and often remote areas. Over the past decades, numerous academic publications have shed light on the history of the Dutch Atlantic slave trade and of slavery in the Dutch Americas. These scholarly contributions, in combination with the social and political activism of the descendants of Caribbean slaves, have helped to bring the subject of slavery into the national public debate. The fact that slavery also played a prominent role in the growth of the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, a prosperous organization notorious for its slave crimes, has seemingly been forgotten. This public ignorance merely reflects the state of academic scholarship on the subject. Slavery has never been a fashionable topic among historians of the VOC, and its general absence in the literature is not an exclusively Dutch phenomenon either. Whenever the topic of slavery is discussed in contemporary society, an instinctively defensive reaction has been to claim that it was always a natural and widely accepted institution among human beings, and that even the tolerant Dutch were unaware of its moral wrongs until the abolitionist movement emerged in the late 18th century. A closer look, however, reveals that argumentation is deceiving at best. First of all, the early modern Dutch, and with them most other Europeans, no longer deemed it morally acceptable to enslave fellow Europeans. Apparently, slave status was only fitting for people of African or Asian descent. Fortunately, the past cannot be hidden forever, and several exposures to the history of the Dutch role in slavery have brought about several changes. The ongoing discussions about an official apology for the Dutch role in slavery, the erection of monuments to commemorate that history, and the inclusion of topics of slavery in the first national history canon are all testimony to this increased attention for a troubled past. In June 2013, the Council of Churches was the first to step up and apologize on the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the Netherlands. In July 2023, Dutch King Willem Alexander also offered a formal apology for the Netherlands' historic involvement in slavery and the effects that it still has in the present day. This apology came on the 160th anniversary of the legal abolition of slavery in the Netherlands, including its former colonies in the Caribbean. In his speech, Willem Alexander said that Dutch ships transported more than 600,000 individuals out of Africa and across the Atlantic, 75,000 of whom did not survive the journey. The monarch also commissioned independent research into his family's involvement in the slave trade, with results expected in 2026. According to a study published in early 2023, the House of Orange Nassau, the Royal House of the Netherlands, made around $600 million in today's money from slavery in the Dutch colonies between 1675 and 1770, including shares in the Dutch East India Company gifted to the family. Willem Alexander's apology comes in the midst of a larger reckoning with the Netherlands' involvement in the slave trade. In 2022, the country's Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, made a similar apology, acknowledging the Dutch state bears responsibility in the Atlantic slave trade and profited from it.
The government also announced a fund of more than $200 million to increase awareness and involvement and follow-up regarding the country's legacy of slavery. The Dutch were not only leading participants in the transatlantic slave trade, they were also the cruelest among the slave masters. During the years 1624 to 1763, the Dutch were the most brutal of slave masters. The Dutch slave code was much harsher than the Spanish code. The savagery of the Dutch code is shown by one provision of calculated cruelty, the burning alive of mutinous slaves over a slow fire. The Dutch had no institution comparable to the Spanish Audiencia, a tribunal that included four judges. The ruthlessness of the Dutch also created a situation that came to a climax in the Burbish Slave Rebellion. Berbice was a series of Dutch plantations founded in the mid-18th century in what's now Guyana, named for the river along which the plantations were situated. It was also the site of an astonishing slave rebellion in 1763. After enduring the horrors of being captured and surviving the transatlantic crossing, West African slaves brought to Berbice had to toil in the blazing sun for 10 hours a day, six days a week, with maybe a day off at Christmas. Disease was rampant, while whippings and torture, even of children, were commonplace. After a localized insurrection was put down in 1762, resentments boiled over a year later. Rebelling slaves began their attacks on a Sunday morning, while the Dutch were at church. The rebelling slaves were led by a man named Coffage. He envisioned a kind of dual state arrangement. The Dutch would stay on their side of the Burbis River, the now free slaves on the other, and the two sides could even establish trade relations. After over a year of fruitless negotiations with the Dutch, internal divisions, and exhausted spirits, a coup was mounted against the leader, Kolfage. In keeping with West African tradition, he would take his own life. Today, a 1763 monument of the slave rebel leader Kolfage stands in the Square of the Revolution in the Guyanese capital of Georgetown. The Dutch later interrogated hundreds of the surviving slaves, leaving behind exceedingly rare records that reflect the voices of slaves from over two and a half centuries ago. In all, 124 people were executed. Some of the condemned were to have every bone broken on the rack with an iron bar before dying from either a mercy blow to the heart or a merciless blow to the skull. Others were to be burned at the stake with a regular fire, which took an hour, or with a small fire, where the victim smoldered alive for four hours. Some faced the additional torture of having their flesh ripped with hot pincers. The lucky ones were hanged, their heads staked. Sadly, but not surprisingly, slavery remains a taboo subject in the Netherlands, a country that profited so enormously from it. Like most Europeans, the Dutch enjoy only those aspects of history that celebrate themselves. As such, many Dutch people go through school and life learning absolutely nothing about the vast crime that contributed so much to the wealth they now enjoy. Many Dutch historians go as far as denying that Dutch involvement barely had an impact on the slave trade. To truly understand Dutch influence in the slave trade, we need to go back in time and analyze the transatlantic slave trade that lasted centuries. The Dutch and the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade was a remarkably straightforward and one-directional migration, the key component of an ingenious triangular commercial system that has been well documented. Ships loaded with a carefully selected assortment of products sailed from diverse ports in Western Europe to the West African coast, where European merchants exchanged these commodities for African slaves sold by local traders. The human cargo was then transported to strategic locations in the Americas, before returning home carrying slave-produced commodities such as sugar, coffee, and tobacco to the European market. It was a good example of the emergence of global trade in the early modern period. If the voyage went as planned, and this included keeping slave mortality on board to a minimum, investors stood to profit from several transactions. For the African victims, the Middle Passage was merely one part of their tragic journey to the Americas. First, they experienced enslavement, coerced transportation, and confinement in Africa itself, before being sold to what must have seemed strange white men who subsequently moved them under excruciating circumstances across the Atlantic Ocean. Finally, after disembarking in the Americas, they often faced further regional trading and transport. For the great majority of them, backbreaking labor on large commercial plantations under the tropical sun loomed as the final destination. The forced alienation of those who survived this initial ordeal undeniably impacted their identity. From local or tribal affiliations within Africa to a more diffuse African identity versus the Europeans on board, 
and with the passage of time to the birth of uniquely African-American slave cultures. Due to its highly organized and business-like character, with slave embarkation, mortality, and disembarkation being meticulously registered, historians have been left with large amounts of administrative evidence from which the business, volume, and direction of the transatlantic slave trade can be reconstructed. At present, there are 1,237 officially documented Dutch slave voyages, with a total of 408,658 slaves departing from Africa. However, the actual numbers are an estimated total of 554,300 slaves exported by the Dutch, or roughly 4.4% of the overall volume of the transatlantic slave trade. And of these slaves, around 475,200 reached the Americas alive with a mortality rate of 14.3%. However, there are other accounts that state that more were transported. Despite the inherent subjectivity of all assumptions, extrapolations, and estimations involved, historians generally agree that slightly more than half a million Africans were transported on Dutch ships, with somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 slaves perishing before they reached the New World. Given that their commercial activities on the African coast dated back to the mid-1590s, the Dutch waited several decades before actively participating in the slave trade. Initially, Dutch African trade was primarily focused on gold, and to a much lesser extent, ivory. Their first official settlement on the African coast, Fort Nassau at Moorie on the Gold Coast, did not spark any serious slaving activities either. This hesitation can be attributed to the fact that the Dutch still lacked a suitable American colony with a strong demand for slave labor. As the rise of Dutch colonial expansion was closely tied to the enduring conflict with Spain, as well as with Portugal since 1580, Iberian shipping became fair game for Dutch privateers. The capture of Portuguese slave ships in and around the Atlantic Ocean resulted in what has been labeled an incidental slave trade. Slaves carried by the enemy were defined as contraband, and when possible, sold to the nearest friendly buyer. The conquest of Pernambuco and several other Portuguese captaincies in northeast Brazil during the early 1630s handed the Dutch West India Company, or WIC, the richest sugar-producing area in the world and a full-blown slave society at that. The company officials soon came to the realization that without slaves, sugar cultivation was in danger. After the surrounding rural areas were sufficiently pacified, the WIC began expanding its commercial interests on the African coast by simply conquering long-established Portuguese trading posts. Earlier attempts to do so had failed miserably, but victories at Arguin in 1633, Elmina in 1637, and Sao Paulo de Luanda and Sao Tome in 1641 guaranteed an unprecedented Dutch dominance on the African coast. Never would the Dutch have easier access to slaves than during the 1640s. The history of Dutch Brazil can be divided into three acts. First, the conquest and consolidation of a sizable territory for sugar cultivation, followed by a decade of relative peace and prosperity under the enlightened governorship of Johann Moritz van Nassau, and finally, renewed warfare with the local Portuguese colonists, leading to the ultimate surrender of the colony in 1654. During the government of Moritz, thousands of slaves were imported by the WIC, heralding the official involvement by the Dutch in the transatlantic slave trade. At first, these slaves were mainly procured from the Calabar region, which is the Slave Coast, Bight of Benin, and Bight of Biafra, and the region north of the Congo River. But the Dutch, fueled by the traditional preferences of the Portuguese-Brazilian sugar planters for Angolan slaves, would take the main port of Luanda in 1641. The increasing volume of slave imports and sugar exports in the 1640s came to a sudden halt when open hostilities broke out shortly after Mori had returned to Europe. Everywhere sugar plantations and mills were burned to the ground or halted their production. The Dutch slave trade to Brazil may have generated less of a historic impact than the few incidental slaves delivered to other locations in the New World in the previous decades. The Dutch did introduce more slaves from West Africa to Brazil, primarily from the slave coast, thereby perhaps introducing the first Igbo from the Bight of Biafra in Pernambuco as well. War undoubtedly had a dramatic but also liberating effect on the lives of slaves in Brazil. New slaves arriving from Angola could no longer be sold or fed by the company. The Hoga Rod in Recife begged its WIC colleagues in Luanda to stop sending slaves across the Atlantic, and those who had already arrived were now redirected north. In January 1646, the Tamandare sailed with a cargo of slaves from Fernando da Norona via Barbados 
to New Amsterdam. The relative ease with which this merchandise was sold appeared as a harbinger of things to come, with Dutch Brazil sliding into the chaos of civil war in the mid-1640s, the WIC faced a dilemma. What should be done about the slave trade, especially after its short-lived supremacy on the African coast, was eroded when the Portuguese recaptured Luanda and Sao Tome in 1648 and the English slaving activities were expanding. To resolve this, the Dutch would open new markets for slaves in the English and French Caribbean by introducing slave-based sugar cultivation closely resembling the Brazilian model. The first Navigation Act in 1651 established under Cromwell was mainly intended to suppress Dutch trade to the English colonies and fueled the growing animosity between the two maritime superpowers, eventually leading to three naval wars between 1652 and 1674. Increasingly stifled by the mercantilist policies of England and France, the Dutch looked, ironically perhaps, to the colonies of their former enemy Spain to provide new markets for the slave trade. Between 1646 and 1657, Dutch traders sold about 3,800 slaves to Santo Domingo, Puerto Rico, and Tierra Firme, while between 1657 and 1663, 14 Dutch slave ships arrived at Buenos Aires in the Rio de la Plata region alone. It is in this volatile arena that the emergence of Curaçao as a slave trade entrepot for the Spanish Americas should be situated. No longer useful as a military base now that the war with Spain had ended and never entirely suited for commercial plantation agriculture, the company was desperately looking for another niche. For the next half century, Curaçao would take advantage of the Asiento trade, receiving saltwater slaves from Africa and distributing them to the Spanish Americas according to contracts made in Europe. The Asiento contracts were renewed and reconfigured several times during the second half of the 17th century, thereby consolidating the Dutch position as a major player in the transatlantic slave trade. Altogether, almost a 100,000 slaves, or roughly 20% of the entire Dutch slave trade, accordingly found their way to the Spanish Americas between 1658 and 1729, with a sizable number from the slave coast, thus further diversifying the ethnic makeup of the Spanish colonies. Except for their short layover at Curaçao and their impact on the island economy, most of these Africans quickly disappeared from the Dutch colonial realm. And while this transit trade enhanced the historic reputation of the Dutch as slave traders, the slaves themselves ended up in Spanish, not Dutch colonies. With Curaçao evolving into Amsterdam's Caribbean counterpart, other Dutch colonies in the Americas received slaves only sparingly during the 1650s and 1660s. Governor Peter Stuyvesant of New Netherland repeatedly requested slaves from Curaçao, but only a few actually arrived. Sound business acumen, not national solidarity, ensured that most surplus or refuse slaves were sold closer to home, and usually at much better prices. New Netherland simply could not compete with the Caribbean plantation colonies in their demand for slave labor. Of the two large slave cargoes arriving in New Amsterdam, most of the slaves of Het Witte Peert were quickly resold to tobacco planters in the Chesapeake, and the 290 slaves disembarking from the Gideon were just in time to witness the peaceful surrender of New Amsterdam to the English. New Netherland was by all accounts never more than a peripheral destination in the slave trade, even if the small stream of slaves arriving would lay the foundation of a vibrant African-American community. The Peace of Breda, settling the Second Anglo-Dutch War and swapping New Netherland for Suriname, would greatly impact the future of the Dutch transatlantic slave trade. For the next century and a half, the Dutch colonial possessions in the Americas would remain largely unchanged. One could even say that the failed colonization of New Holland, or Dutch Brazil, and New Netherland, which is Dutch New York, made the WIC domain leaner and meaner, and heavily concentrated on the lower Caribbean. This suited the financial and structural reorganization of the company in the early 1670s very well. With Curaçao now in its golden age as a slave trade entrepot to the Spanish Americas, and with Suriname emerging as the quintessential Dutch plantation colony, the future opportunities for the slave trade looked promising. Curaçao and Suriname were the primary beneficiaries of the Dutch slave trade in this period, receiving almost equal numbers, with the crucial difference being that most slaves to Curaçao were transferred to Spanish colonies, while Suriname functioned as an end destination. Between 1676 and 1716, over 42,000 African slaves arriving at Curaçao were distributed among Spanish traders. 
When, after the War of Spanish Succession from 1702 to 1713, the Asiento contracts fell squarely into English hands, the slave trade to Curaçao rapidly declined. Not only did this have immediate effects on the island's economy and the activities of the local company slaves, but it would result in a rapid creolization of its African-American population and the sustained growth of a free black community. During the 1730s, the WIC relinquished its monopoly on the transatlantic slave trade, leading to the emergence of a large private slave trade and the end of its illegal forerunners, the interlopers. Companies such as the Middleburgsche Commerce Compagnie, or MCC, and the Rotterdam-based firm of Rochusen were now mainly responsible for delivering slaves to Suriname and the smaller Dutch plantation colonies on the Wild Coast like Berbice, Essequibo, and Demerara. As a consequence, the historic connections between Zeeland and the Wild Coast were rekindled, with almost 80% of the Dutch private slave trade organized by companies from that maritime province. The extent to which this trade expanded dramatically in the mid-18th century, before decreasing just as rapidly during the latter decades, becomes evident due to the state of the Suriname Plantation Society itself, which suffered from a financial crisis and limited profitability, partly related to the continuous resistance of the Maroon communities. It was also due to the general decline of the Dutch Republic, no longer a major player in Europe, with English supremacy in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War confirming the loss of their maritime prowess. The inability of the Dutch to keep pace with economic developments was quickly answered by increased British and U.S. slave trading activities. The U.S. and English would take over with a total of 7,011 slaves arriving in Suriname on U.S. ships during the 1780s and 1790s, with the British focusing predominantly on Essequibo and Demerara, especially after occupying these colonies in 1795. The colonies were shortly returned to the Dutch during the era of the Batavian Republic from 1795 to 1805, much to the chagrin of even the Dutch planters. A total of six Dutch slave voyages in 1802 to 1803 delivered an estimated 1,287 slaves to Suriname. More than six decades later, slavery would be abolished by the Dutch. While the Netherlands marked formally abolished slavery in 1863, it took another 10 years before the slaves began to enjoy their freedom. Slavery would continue for another decade, as many enslaved people were forced to work on plantations to limit financial losses for the owners. Therefore, many descendants of the slaves consider 1873, not 1863, as the date of abolition. In contrast, England proclaimed abolition in 1834, France in 1848, and the USA in 1865. So, the Netherlands was one of the last countries to abolish the abhorrent crime. Students of history will also remember that in Africa, the Dutch were also the last to decolonize in South Africa. The Dutch king making a shocking apology for Dutch participation in the barbaric slave trade and other acts to make slavery well known to the Dutch come in response to critics pushing for the Netherlands to speak up about its part in the brutal history of slavery rather than hide from the truth. Hopefully, the Portuguese, the Spanish, Belgium, the USA, the French, and Britain would follow suit and make restitutions for centuries of slavery and poverty inflicted on the African communities within their countries and on the African continent. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.